it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, uh, how's your marathon going today? You said you have a, usually I'm a marathon. I'm good. <laughs> the dogs, they're a little barky today. Um, they, I, I don't know what it is. Some days they're barkier than others. Today is one of those days. Um, but yeah, good. Um, I, this is my, let's see, it's 10, so four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. This is already my sixth hour awake. So. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, do you wake up at four in the morning on purpose or did you lose a bet or? <laughs> yeah. No, I wake up on purpose. Actually, the, the story behind it was um, one of my cats who is no longer with us. So I have a, I have a rescue home with 14 pets. Oh, it used wow. to be 15. Um, one of the cats who is no longer with us was one of those cats who loved to eat. And um, Obi, uh, short for Obi-Wan, I'm a Star Wars nice. fan, nice. Um, would wake everyone, anyone, in the house up at four o'clock in the morning so he could eat okay and and so we i got so used to this schedule to get up and to feed him at 4 a.m and then I, I just stuck with it because then i get up and i do my morning routine i get all 14 dishes ready i get all the human food ready um i get to have a cup of tea in the morning uh, before i really get into any heavy work and and i get to you know get a jog in and everything so it's, it's definitely on purpose now it wasn't but it is now <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Um, I love that you rescue, have so many rescue animals. Are are you like fostering them or are you like just, we're going to rescue them, we're just going to keep them and they're going to live here with us? I'm a foster failure. I <laughs> will freely admit that I cannot do that. Um, yeah. Once they're in the house, I, I did it one time and they, the dog went to a really fantastic home. Um, and I still to this day, I'm like, I should have kept that dog. <laughs> I, I um, understand. They're all mine. <laughs> No, I, I get it. Um, every, every animal we've had has been like a rescue and, um, we don't have any right now. Uh, long story won't bother you with it, but, um, it's, I don't, uh, I appreciate people who can foster. I, I myself would like, you get too attached. Um, yep. you know, and that's my wife has always suggested, well, maybe you should like volunteer down at the shelter. I'm like, I will bring them all home. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I will fall in love with every animal here and they, we will have 60 dogs in the house. You know, it's just not, it's just not tenable, you know, but um, so kudos to you for being such a good rescue mommy there. Thank you. Yeah. I'm the same way. I, I barely can make it through like a shelter. If someone's like, Hey, can you come with me? I'm like, no, because <laughs> I'm going to end up with, you'll end up with like one dog and I'll end up with five. Yeah. So, no, <laughs> <laughs> I, I get it. Um, are you, are you, uh, are primarily cats, uh, and dogs, or do you like rescue other animals as well? Primarily cats and dogs. I think like okay. one time we did like a field mouse who had lost its mother. Um, and, and here and there, like we'll, we'll try to do like a, I found a baby rabbit, um, who they're incredibly difficult to care for. You got to get yeah. really quickly to a professional. Yeah. Um, he did not make it, but we tried to get him some food and get him there, but he didn't make it. But so we, we stick to, um, dogs and cats because we can, we pretty much know how to deal with those. Sure. Um, right. And there's a reason, you know, as cruel as it sounds, it's like when the mom kicks those babies out, there's a reason, like they're just not mm -hmm. fit for this world. They're not going to make it, you know, same thing with squirrels and other small, you know, animals. And, but the, you know, the heart goes out, like you want them to survive you want to yeah. nurture them and then put them back out in the wild so they can have their best life you know so uh, right. I, I totally get it i totally get it well thank you again for uh for coming on the show um i'll, I'll do my introduction and then um we'll we'll get right into it does that sound All good right, to you good okay hey this is mark justice and welcome back to between the lines tonight we have a really fun show with very prolific multi-series writer nelly Steele. nelly welcome to between the lines thank you it's great to be here uh it's, it's great to have you i uh, am so impressed and i can't wait to ask all about your different series um it was just like uh i i, I love that people working in it's similar genres but then there's there's differences between them because so i was doing my homework and looking at your series and like oh yeah i, I want to read that <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's just start with something uh, big like big picture kinds of questions like growing up who were some of your favorite writers um i was a big victoria holt reader uh, after i graduated out of nancy drew of course 
So, you know, every little girl starts with Nancy Drew and um, I can still remember trying to pick like the Nancy Drew book um, from the library. Our library actually at the time was in the basement of a tiny building that was our municipal building. Don't worry, we have a real library now, but it was in a basement. I can still remember sitting on that cold, uh, like cement floor, looking at this little tiny rack of books, trying to figure out which Nancy Drew book I wanted next. So I was a big Nancy Drew fan. Um, which I think comes out in a lot of my writing. I, I was going to say that I, too. I, Sorry. I, I was, when I, there was one series, um, it might've been like the Lily and Cassie by, the, and sea. Cassie by the sea. I was thinking that sounds, or even also the Maggie Edwards also like sound like very much like a Nancy Drew kind mm -hmm. of inspired. So thank you. I'll let you continue. Sorry. No, that's fine. No, that that definitely had some bearing on my writing. I love those books. I loved how empowered Nancy Drew was. Um, and that definitely inspired me as I, as I move forward, both in my real career, because the writing is actually my secondary. Um, I'm a, a college professor in statistics and data science, first and foremost. Um, so, uh, you know, as I move forward in both careers, Nancy Drew definitely uh, her her spunk and her enthusiasm um, definitely helped propel me into what I was eventually going to do. And then um, I, you know, I read my, my mom and my grandmother were big Victoria Holt fans. So I can still remember reading, you know, the girl running away from castle books, um, which is probably what really inspired the first book that I um, published, which was the secret of Dunhaven Castle. So that has a very Nancy Drewish feel too. Kate's a very uh, Nancy Drew type of character as well. I love that. Um... Well, there's a whole world of questions into going on, like the difference between your professional life and your writing life, because those are like different worlds altogether, yeah. you know, statistics and, and things They're like, oh, um, it's like left brain, right brain, you know, uh, it, it, it's a very simplistic terms. Um, so so the, those books kind of what drew you into writing, because what what was the trigger for you that that made you want to say, you know, I, I think I want to tell stories is the reading aspect I get. And, and I, I love that you were such an, uh, a voracious reader. Um, you know, I was read to from the womb, you know, and it could read mm -hmm. by the time I went to kindergarten. And I remember like thinking like, you know, we're learning our ABCs in kindergarten. I'm like, why aren't these kids like reading? You know, I didn't realize how special of a gift that I had been given as a child to, to be able to read by the time I was five, I was like reading books, you know, and um, so it's a really reading, I think is the best thing you could do for a child, mm -hmm. you know, encouraging that fostering that love of books and, and we get the, you know, the, the, the uh, our school would have the book program I'm assuming yours mm -hmm. did too, or like once a month or something yep. you get books. Oh, it's like Christmas, you know. Uh -huh. um, so, I can relate to that definitely. Yeah. Um, and my mom was a big Nancy True fan. And um, I, I never read those, but I was around that they were around me. So I, I kind of got it. You know, I wasn't really into the Hardy Boys. It was not my thing. I was more like reading H.G. Wells and things like that. And, and um, but I totally understood it, her love for those books and the fact that the series keeps on going. Uh -huh. it, it, you know, the fact that it resonates with, so, you know, the, the young girls who are reading it are now women and who are still inspired by Nancy Drew. I mean, that's that's amazing to have this longevity and that connection still to that character. It definitely is. And it, it's something that stuck with me. And, and I, um, outside of Nancy Drew, I was one of those readers, too, who, who loved to jump into all kinds of different genres. And I think that's now reflected in my work um, because I can't pick a lane. You know, I'm still a Peter Pan, if you will. Um, but you know, that was definitely one of the more memorable series and, and to, to go to a bookstore, I remember going to a bookstore when, um, my goddaughter was born and, and looking at Nancy Drew and thinking she's going to read these too. Um, you know, I read them, she's going to read them and just generations of girls and, and, um, still reading the same character is amazing. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, what, what was the trigger that brought you back into writing like you obviously enjoyed these stories when did it when did it flick in your head like okay I I want to write these now so I wrote on and off like growing up but then as I got into you know college years and everything I started focusing on my careers so went to grad school and most of the reading I did was textbooks at that point uh, most of the writing I did was more scientific and I started writing nonfiction at that point when I when I graduated with my PhD in statistics, I was writing nonfiction books then in statistics oh. and, and using software for processing statistical analysis. 
Um, and so that was the first, you know, real published writing that I did. Um, and then, um, you know, it struck me as I, as I progressed through my career, I got to a point where, um, you know, I was, I was going for a promotion at my highest rank and I knew like, okay, this, I'm either going to move into, you know, a, a different field at this point, I'm going to go into like administration or something else, or I'm going to do something else. Um, because I've kind of progressed to my, in my career to the top of where I would be as a professor. Um, and it was a really cold, snowy January, and I was sitting in my office, and I was actually thinking about what I was going to get my mom for her birthday in June, because I'm a planner. I'm not a planner when it comes to writing. I'm, I'm a pantser. Definitely. Oh, great. That's that's something I wanted to talk about, right? Excellent. Yeah, but I'm a planner and everything else, weirdly. <laughs> okay. and, and so That's why and, you're you know, a pantser in writing, probably. Right. Yes. So six months before her birthday, I'm thinking, what am I going to get her? She's like the type of person who doesn't need a lot. You know, she's very no frills. She's kind of like, if I need it, I just buy it on Amazon. So what do you get for someone like that? And I thought, you know, there's never going to be a perfect time to start writing, but I miss it. I want to go, I want to do it. I like, I had always thought about writing a book, even, you know, in my middle school years, it was like, you know, maybe it, that would be like a cool thing to do is share a story with the world. So I started writing and, um, I quickly realized that I had to know lots more about the writing process, the publishing process and so on. So I um, went and took a writing certificate. And um, what was creative, I Creative writing? Like a creative Pardon writing? Me? A creative writing path? Mm -hmm. Yep, a creative oh, nice. writing. Nice. Yeah. So I took a creative writing certificate program and I was in the process of writing my first book then, the first published book I'd have, The Secret of Dunhaven Castle, which was a birthday present to my mom. And I was trying to keep it a secret just in case like this didn't pan out or I lost interest in it or whatever. So um, I, I was, I had actually was doing some work with another publishing company in nonfiction. And I remember telling my mom that, that I had gotten this job with this nonfiction work, um, which I um, finished earlier than I told her. So she kept saying to me, this job is taking so much of your time. Like, you know, I, I, I don't see you. I don't hear from you You're on your laptop continuously. And um, what I was doing was actually finishing my creative writing certificate and then finishing the novel. Um, so for her birthday, she got um, a scavenger hunt. So she got a set of clues she had to solve um, that would take her to various locations. And when she got to the last location, there was a copy of the draft of the book. And I said, it's up to you if we publish it or not. Um, I've researched publishing. I think I want to go the indie route because I'm a control freak and I like to have control of everything. So um, I, I know what we need to do, but I'm going to let it be up to you on whether or not, you know, you think we have something here and I'm happily continuing to write at this point. Um, so I know, you know, that whether I publish it or not, I'm, I'm happy creating things at least to share with my family. Um, and she started reading it and she liked it and she published it. And so now here we are a couple years later. Um, she's my business partner. Uh, she creates the covers for me. She creates character art for me. She uh, runs a Facebook group for me where um, readers can come in and discuss uh, all the different characters and series and stories. So she, we are doing wonderfully. I think we're like, um, you know, 10 or 12 books later. <laughs> um, yeah we launched a, a, hopefully what will be a nice little set of stories for readers to enjoy. I just love every part of that. Yeah. That's fantastic. So I hope, well, apparently her audition and her interview went well, <laughs> you know, to be in the, <laughs> this role for you. Um, well, kudos on your PhD. I didn't know that doctor. Um, I would have referred to you as Dr. Steele um, uh, in that regard. And uh, cause I've spent, a couple of decades in academia as well. So I understand, um, and my BFA is in creative writing. So I, uh, congratulations on all that. Thank you. And um, that's what a delightful story. I, I that it, it's so fun. Uh, I, I didn't dedicate, I, my first book was a cozy mystery. Um, and while I didn't dedicate it to like anyone in my family, I, my family members have enjoyed reading it because I, some of the characters are based mm -hmm. on family members. You know, there's a grandma character who's totally my grandma, <laughs> you know, and it's really homage to her uh, in, in that respect. And so there's lots of tears and laughter from the people who in my family who read it. So I totally get the dedication to like wanting to honor someone through that. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, and um, actually my first character um, who's in The Secret of Dunhaven Castle, Kate, is named for my grandmother, Catherine. 
So that was part of the gift too, was that, um, you know, the, the character was named Catherine with a C after my grandmother, Catherine. So I love that. Um, and, and my grandma character is Mabel Bennett, which was her, Matt Bennett was her last name. Um, and, uh, so yes, uh, she would have laughed and she, but she would have, she would have said, now, Mark Allen, don't, don't be telling all my stories because everything, mm -hmm. the way she speaks and the stories that she has are, are the memories that I have with her. And I love bringing them out in the story like that because, and as a writer, you ever create so much, there's so much wholesale invention, but to bring so much of a, of your person into a story, it, it, it's a kind of a wonderful way of, of, of sharing that and also preserving that and celebrating it, you know, and all those, all those Absolutely. ways. Uh, yeah. uh, well, let's, let's talk about your different series. I mean, you've got the Duchess of Blackmore mysteries. You've got Kate Kenzie, Scottish Highlands, cozy animal mysteries, Lily and Cassie by the sea mysteries, shadow slayers, supernatural suspense, and in Maggie Edwards adventures. And I like the one about the mystery of the onks. I'm like, Ooh, that, you know, okay. You have you started with one story and now what really made you want to write and he's very kind of related except for the one that sticks out the supernatural suspense is like the only one that isn't really part of the other ones so how does it did you come from writing one book for your mom to saying you know what i'm gonna have at least five different series uh working on i know you said you were you couldn't stick in one lane is that part of part of the writing process for you it's part of it. I'm, I'm kind of an, not only an eclectic reader, but an eclectic watcher, if you will. So, you know, I, I grew up watching things like Indiana Jones, which is where we get the inspiration for Maggie Edwards. You know, it's a modern Indiana Jones story with a female lead, um, which is sorely lacking in the market. Um, they tried know, with, I, with Tomb Raider a little bit. Yeah, yeah, they but, tried with yeah. Tomb Raider. Um, we And I enjoyed that, uh, that series. But, you know, Indiana Jones is really the iconic one. You look at National Treasure, it's got a male lead. If you look at the major right. uh, writers in that genre, you know, you have Kessler, Rollins and those types, and they're all male leads for the most part. So, sure. you know, I yeah. try to bring a female lead into the into yeah. the mix there. Um, but um, I, I also watched lots of supernatural things. So Dark Shadows was a favorite of mine. Yes. Um, lots of people ran home to watch Barnabas. I didn't quite make the cutoff for the first time around, but I watched it on sci-fi. Um, it, my mom was a run home and watch him. So she introduced me to that. Absolutely loved the work that they did on that series. Great storytelling, great acting, um, really fun. Um, I know it's a little bit quirky and people will kind of laugh at it now, but I mean, the work that they did on a day-to-day -day basis to, to pull off what they pulled off was phenomenal. Um, yes. And that show stuck with me. And that's where Shadow Slayers comes from. Okay. It's really um, in that vein. It's really a tribute to the Dark Shadows. It, I mean, if if you read it, there's a character in there, Celeste, who is you know the Angelique of the series. You know, she's very beautiful but very cunning. Sure, um, sure. And we, and we have these these characters, witches and warlocks, living in the everyday world, and you know, in this little town in Maine, just like um, Collinwood was, and, right. and the Collins family. So it was really inspired by that. And I, and I think what I realized was as I watched all of these movies and read all of these books, I was inspired by things and I would have these stories kind of floating around in my head and I thought they would that's where they would live. And then when I started writing The Secret of Dunhaven Castle, I suddenly realized that all these stories could be put on paper and shared with everyone else. So, you know, I just started writing. Um, and I, the reason I wrote Shadow Slayers was because when I wrote the first Kate Kenzie, um, when it was going out for um, beta reads and we thought we were going to publish this and all that. And I thought, I better not write the second Kate Kenzie because what if everybody hates Kate? <laughs> and so I wrote the Shadow Slayer story next okay. because then if everybody disliked Kate, it was like, okay, how about this one? We'll try that instead. Sure, right. Um, so, you know, I wrote a variety. And then as I started writing those two series, you know, other ideas populated in my mind. And it was like, you know what? I loved Indiana Jones. I'd love to do something like that. So I wrote that. Um, I grew up reading Victoria Holt, which is historical fiction, girls running away from castles and the, um, the, the gothic story, theme, just yeah, like in the just fun like, story yeah. with, with Lenora is, um, she wasn't actually a thought in my head until that cover came. Um, it was a test cover for shadows of the past <clears throat> and it did not fit the series at all, but I fell in love with the cover and I was like, 
please don't get rid of this cover because I'm going to, I'm going to write a book for this cover because I love it, but it cannot be for shadows of the past. It just doesn't fit with the, right. with the genre and the theme of the book. Um, so I, I, you know, started, I was looking at the cover. I would look at it every once in a while and suddenly she pops in my head and, you know, I'm, I'm a pantser. My characters tell me the story and I just put it down on paper. So, you know, I, I got to a point where, you know, laying in bed at night, I could hear her talking and telling me what her story was going to be. And then I would start writing it. So, so that book was actually inspired by her cover instead of, you know, the other way around the cover is usually inspired by the book, (laughs) but that one came from the, the cover itself. So. I love that. Um, this is, this is really the reason why I started this podcast. Um, I've been doing two other podcasts, one unsane radio I've been doing for almost three years. Um, and heavy metal horror, I started, uh, almost a year ago. And, uh, but this one, cause I've met so many interesting people on Instagram and a lot of writers through Instagram like you, and I'm intrigued by their, their stories, what they write, their, their, the genres in which they write. And it's been such a supportive community. It's like, I need to get to know people more. I want to hear their stories. I want them to showcase them what makes them them. And, and hearing your stories, it just, it just fills me with such joy. Uh, because I was, I grew up watching Dark Shadows because my mom was one of the kids who came home and watched it. And so when it was on reruns in the seventies, that's when I started watching it. And I just fell in love with it because I was a monster kid. So I would never have watched a soap opera had it not been for the fact that there were vampires and witches and werewolves. And, you know, that's what I was there to see, you know, this unfolding story. So I, I totally, totally get that. And my mom was a Gothic reader. So I would always see these books and I was a little too young to kind of get the genre it wasn't anything that pulled me in because it wasn't scary enough for me like mm-hmm. you know the cover but i see the cover it's a painted cover here's a, a woman in a in a white dress and she's running away and there's this this wavy ocean crashing on one side and this dark castle looming in the distance on the other and it's at night you know so i completely get the that gothic feel from that uh, and i tried reading it i'm like eh. You know, I'm like, where's the monsters? You know, I was wanting it to be scary. Where are the ghosts? You know, it was too gentle for me at the time. But, um, but I, I, I just, I love that. I love that the reasons why you brought up all these genres and had inspiration from just a picture. And um, I want to talk to you about the pantsing as as we go. I want to, I do want to talk about that because I'm a, I'm a, a plotter. I'm a planner. Um, um, and, and the idea of pantsing a whole novel, it, it blows my head. It's just like, I, 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 I don't even, I lose words. Cause it just like, <laughs> it like starts frying circuits, you know, in my head. Um, but we will get there. I promise. Uh, I do want to ask you though, like what makes a good mystery to you? The characters, I think. Um, and that's something that I focus on a lot. So you know, um, and this is the reason I write series as well as opposed to standalones. And I'm not saying I've never write a standalone or, or you know, something that is that is really just mystery filled and, and the characters are kind of playing a secondary part. But it's the characters. And, and I've, I've gotten um, feedback from readers that say, you know, I love your characters. I even the bad ones. I like them. I want to read about them. I want to be friends with these people. You know, um, and that's that's really important to me. I want to create a character that that people can connect with. Um, it, you know, because some people are are using this to, you know, to escape from their reality or to travel or to be somewhere that they're not right now. Um, you know, and, and I think it's important for people to, to connect with the character and want to go along for the journey with them. Um, so, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of great feedback that people say, I absolutely loved your character. I would, I would love to be friends with your character. And that means a lot to me. And, and I think they're what drives the story. And I think this is why I can be a pantser um, because, you know, it's their personalities that really drive forward how the plot will move. So, um, you know, I know like lots of people have different criteria for what is a good mystery. Some people want action all the time. Some people, you know, want some comedy involved. Um, but, you know, I, for the most part, want to be invested in that character. And, and again, that's why I write series as we move through, you see more things going on other than the mystery. So there are parts of their lives involved in, in many of the stories um, in terms of, you know, um, when Kate goes to Scotland, part of um, book one is literally her going to Scotland because this is a major change for her. She um, goes from kind of a down and out college professor to a, a countess who owns a castle. And, and it, it, 
it's mind boggling to her. She's, she's very introverted. She's very quiet. She lives with her, her, you know, normal life with her little dog, Riley in a three room apartment. And suddenly she's going to a castle where her own bedroom suite is larger than her apartment was. So we really see Kate's journey. And as we progress through the series, we see her turn from, you know, kind of just Kate to Countess Kate. Um, where she really has to learn how to fill that role. Um, and then, of course, there's the fun of, of what she and Jack get into, who's her estate manager, because they get to solve all the mysteries together. So that's always there, but, but we do kind of see these overarching storylines. And it's funny that you mentioned before um, that Shadow Slayer stuck out to you as kind of the odd man out. Um, and it is a very different series, but what's, what's really fun is in um, book four of Kate Kenzie, the Shadow Slayers actually come over to Kate's world. Oh, nice. So these guys kind of all know each other. Right. And I'm seeing people like, you know, hopping from Kate Kenzie's cozy world into this, like, and it's not brutal or anything. It's very dark shadowsy, very gothic-y, um, but jumping into these types of stories because these people have come over into Kate's world. Kate has learned about the Shadow Slayers. They've become friends of sorts. And now people are wondering, well, what's going on with those people? Because they sound pretty interesting. Yeah. So I, I love doing crossovers. Um, you know, the, the newest Maggie Edwards that'll be coming out, she's uh, familiar with Kate. She'll talk to Kate in her books. So these people all kind of get to know each other, which is fun too, because I love putting my characters together and letting them interact and see what yes, happens. Yes, right. No, I love that. Um... This is making me so happy today. Uh, I, I love, I love that bringing together multiple worlds because you're creating this metaverse in a way, you know, not mm -hmm. to be too trendy, but it just reminds me of reasons why I like Marvel comics as a kid versus DC is that there was a continuity, you know, and mm -hmm. like when Daredevil would show up in a Spider-Man comic book, it was a big deal. Like, you know, like you understand that they look, they're all working in New York. They're bound to run into it one another. And just like the world you're creating, which is something I want to talk about here in a second. Um, they have this interaction with one another and and then I, I like that bringing characters together who normally wouldn't and how are they going to respond to one another which is something i'm kind of pushing and i'm writing the second of my cozy series right now uh and i'm purposely bringing in a bunch of new characters but i'm also pushing characters together that mm -hmm. didn't have interaction in the first book because i want to i want to see how that goes you know um what happens with these these sometimes antagonistic characters, you know, which are kind of fun to write. Oh, um, so your, your characters are make the good mystery. Is, is it the same thing with when you focus on the cozy mystery aspect, or are there other things when you're when you write the difference between your mystery and cozy mystery? How do you know, like, okay, what what elements do you like to focus on for your cozy mystery series? So definitely the characters. And I would say that probably okay. pervades all the way through all of okay. the, the, the series. Um, but, you know, the, the big thing for me with the cozies is making people feel like they're a part of the landscape. Okay. So, you know, I want you to feel like you live in Kate's castle. I want you to feel like you're a guest there, like you're participating in her life, like you're participating in her mystery. Um, and that's the biggest thing I think that drives the Kate Kenzie series, which is still my most popular series, um, is because people feel like they're a part of the fabric of her story okay um, you want to be in this a, town you want to be involved in this community right you, you feel a connection to this this place right okay right and i think the characters really drive it all the way through even the other series so you know you you want to be a part of maggie's um team as she you know jets across the world and tries to find cleopatra's tomb um, the, the character relationships and shadow slayers, I, I think I had a, an editorial review that says this reads like a supernatural soap opera because the relationships are so intertwined and so there. And, and my, um, the, the narrator who did the first three books in that series for me used to say the, the stories are so complex and the people in them and how they weave in and out together. Um, he was amazed that I was a pantser and he was amazed that I write, uh, while I'm watching TV which he was like, I can't <laughs> imagine how you're keeping all that straight, but, um, but that, that's the thing I got used to doing. Sure. Um, so, you know, now I'm used to having background noise and, mm -hmm. and I was a big soap opera fan and they used to do the crossovers on the soaps and stuff like that. Like they'd bring Adam Chandler over to, you know, one life to live and with Dorian and that kind of stuff. So I was, I was so, that was such a big deal to me too, when they bring the other character on, because you'd see people mix that didn't normally mix, um, which is why I love to do the, the crossovers. 
And I, and, you know, I think that, um, that that really impacted me too. And I watched all those, you know, eighties, late night soaps like dynasty and all that. And the dialogue is so fantastic and so over the top that I think that yeah. really feeds into, especially like shadow slayers, um, is a big dialogue based book. There's a lot of interaction between the characters. It's a large cast of characters. And so that's something that drives that series, um, as opposed to like the cozy mystery where you're really kind of a part of the fabric of the story. Okay. I like that. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Um, and I, distractions is something or process of writing is something that, that I, I was wanting to talk about too. And then the fact that you, you know, you've already mentioned it. So, um, cause I've, most writers I know tend to need some kind of distraction, like music. Um, I, yeah. I'd have known this, you're the first writer I've ever talked to who watched, write, wrote while watching TV. Um, and and everyone else I know who like listens to music like myself, I have very particular music. It can't have voices in it. it it's got to be just you know like a soundtracks or like classical music or I like thirties um, mm -hmm. music with uh, Lionel Hampton vibraphone and or or um, Garaldi Vince Garaldi jazz. You know something that kind of you know kind of is nice and and backgroundy and it allows my one part of my brain to listen and enjoy it while the rest of me focuses, you know, and it can be kind of inspiring depending on what I'm writing. You know, uh, when I wrote my last pulp, it was an action horror pulp, my homage to the Phantom, the pulp character, the Phantom. So it, was in, it takes place in the 1930s near Haiti, on Haiti and nearby. So I listened to, uh, found a bunch of voodoo music, voodoo drums and mm -hmm. singing. And so I had like this big five hour block of voodoo drums that I would just like listen to these voodoo chants and music. And it kind of really kind of put me in this, it's a great place like right. i could feel it i could kind of feel the essence of the different types of drums and the instrumentation and the rhythms and it really pulled me in so that's interesting because the soap opera the the dialogue even the daytime soaps are kind of they're kind of funny i mean some of them have play with that tongue-in-cheek you know like when yeah. the devil shows up you know in a in like you know um one like all my children or there's one that comes on still every day i forget days of our lives maybe where like the devil will show up or some kind of crazy or a mm -hmm. witch or something you know mm -hmm. and it's just and like i'm waiting for someone to show the slightest cracks like this 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 is crazy dialogue but they keep their face on the street yeah, they do you know and they're really good at saying oh god i okay i gotta talk about the devil okay you know and they have to like get it out of their system and then hit the camera you know they're professionals but i just thought how much fun is it to write like such absurd like in the best way possible kind of stories like this is like so over the top mm -hmm. there's there's an exuberance and a freedom that comes with that like look if they're gonna swallow that the devil shows up and it's gonna make people offers for their souls then i guess we can write anything you know there's a freedom yeah, that comes i agree with that. I agree. I think that that has really impacted me. I mean, some of the, you know, not only the dark shadow storylines, but I was a regular daytime soap watcher and, and, and some of the storylines are incredible of what they ask us, you know, these day-to-day -day people are being shot at on a regular basis. They're being kidnapped almost all the time. And then they're like walking around at the mall, like nothing happened. Right. Um, and I think what that did for me was allow me to really write um, the shadow slayer series in particular, because these guys are, are for the most part, many of them are regular humans that get drawn into this world and, and they have to kind of mitigate the fact that they can't suddenly just be like, okay, all this stuff exists and we're totally cool with it. But at the same time, they have to be, you know, accepting of it in some ways because they have to face what's happening to them. So I think that's where, you know, as odd as it sounds, soap opera dialogue has really helped me um, in terms of writing because, you know, you watch these people on soaps and these in these really serious situations and they, they do a little tongue in cheek stuff sometimes, but they take it very well. But then at the same time, there, there's a little bit of hold back where they're like, I can't believe this is happening. Right. You know, they do have a breakdown every now and again. And, and I think that's what helps me make my characters more realistic to what people would expect because, you know, I've read books before and, um, and I've enjoyed them where the people, you know, they go all in on paranormal stuff and the characters don't say boo about it. You know, they're just like, mm -hmm. yeah, oh, okay. I have powers now all of a sudden and, you know, boom, here I am. Right. And it, it's a fantastically great way of hand waving at it and saying, I'm not going to deal with it. And the characters are just going to accept it, which is, which is a wonderful tale to tell too. But, um, I always find, you know, I always put myself in the situation and I would be thinking I'd ask questions. There would be things in my mind that I'm like, wait a right. minute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you, if you've, you know, and even if you haven't read the comic book, if you've watched any Spider-Man movie, except for maybe the newest one, where he's like, oh, crap, I've, 
I've got these powers now. I can climb on walls. Holy crap, something's wrong with me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, that's that's great. I, I love that. Um, so, since you are someone who likes to write in multiple genres, uh, are there any genres that you would like to try writing next or down the road? Like, are you going to do science fiction or straight horror or, you know, something of the sort? I've considered doing more of like a horrorish type of genre in the future. I, it's definitely something I've got, I've got in my, um, you know, list of future work. It's something that I would like to try. I'm a little bit afraid that I'll scare myself. Um, so when I write, you know, when I watch like the spooky movies, like, you know, haunting of Hill house or anything, that's like an iconically spooky movie. Yeah. I probably don't sleep for an hour or so that night because I'm like, mm. so I'm, I'm a little worried. I'm a little reluctant that I'm going to frighten myself with what sure. I do. <laughs> right. Right. Um, Cause that it comes out know, and it's just like, it can yeah. be way more terrifying than anything you consciously could think of when, when you let it go. Right. Uh, it reaches right down into the, what terrifies you. And that's what comes up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I would like to try it. I do like to watch movies like that, even though they frighten me. I do like to read books like that, um, you know, like Haunting of Hell House and all that kind of stuff and, and just see, you know, what terrifying things people come up with and, and then end up terrified myself. But it's definitely something I, I've thought about. And, and I one of the ones that you um, you didn't mention, I don't think, and I, I think because it's still it's been announced to like our exclusive group of people, but it, I think it just was announced the other day or it's coming up to be announced soon is I wrote a pirate adventure series too. Oh, I didn't no. See that on, I didn't hear that on your list. And I was thinking, no, I was on your remember? website. Yeah. Was it? I, yeah. I couldn't remember if we put it out there yet because our, yeah. our readers group gets priority on, okay. on getting the announcements. Oh, um, but they've, fun. they've heard, yeah, they've heard about it. It actually was oddly, it was supposed to be a prequel to the latest cozy mystery, the, the Lily and Cassie by the Sea Mysteries. Um, it was going to be a prequel to that. Um, Lily and Cassie move into a house where a pirate's sister lived. And they're, you know, they learn a little bit about the pirate and the sister. And I thought, you know, I'll write a reader's magnet and it'll be like 20,000 words. And I'll just tell a little bit of the backstory of um, these two characters. And that one got away from me. So that's what happens when you're a pantser. Stuff gets away from you. Your characters take over. Um, they turned into a full-blown series of their own. And so the first pirate mystery or the pirate adventure will come out in May, I believe. Oh, oh this is awesome. I, uh, this is like, I, this is like thrilling. I can hear your exuberance and your excitement um, in this. I, I don't know where I would start. Like if I were a brand new reader, just like hearing about you for the first time, I don't know where I'd begin. Honestly, I'm like, you know, it all sounds so exciting. And I love that the characters just took over for you. Like, you know, you, you, some characters you, well, because I'm a plotter, planner, um, I, I definitely have the primary characters and secondary and tertiary characters, but sometimes it's those for me, here's a character who who's performing a function but then I like writing them so mm -hmm. much that yeah. I want to bring them out and make them more pronounced only because it's just too fun to not, you know, to write them, you know, and I, I completely get that. Um, well, a pirate adventure. Uh, Oop, you, I lost your sound. <laughs> Is that better? There we go. <laughs> okay. Oh, I got this. Okay, weird. Um, I like how excited you got there that we actually lost sound for a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, are we talking like modern pirates? Are we talking like like golden age of pirates, um, you know, 17th, 18th century, uh, 16th century for so the pirates? We're in um, the, the late 1700s, early 1800s in this one. So okay. colonial American pirates. Okay, so this is the, kind of the, pirates, the, the Caribbean type of stuff. The sunset of the pirate era. Right. Yeah, it's the tour. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, that's exciting. And, and I'll bring out um, a, a, f a potential female pirate here because um, you know Cliff's sister is a woman beyond uh, her time. She's a very intelligent woman. She's an author. She wants to you know have independence and freedom. Cliff offers her that, and she will be joining him on the pirate ship as one of the ah. female pirates. So another hopefully strong female character for um, our little girls to latch on to. Yes, how, how could they not? want to be a pirate i mean that is just five kinds of awesome um yeah that's so exciting well let's talk a little bit about your world building because you have so many worlds 
in which these characters have it. And then it was your, with your mystery series or cozy mystery series, you want readers to be, they feel connected to that world. So how do you design your world or is it something that you cognitively or actively go out and design ahead of time? Or is it something that unfolds as you write because you know, you're a pantser? Um, it's probably a little bit of both. Uh, and it depends on the series. So I noticed a trend um, as I was writing the third book in the Maggie Edwards is that for those books, I spend a lot more time, like I, I spent like days walking around on Google Maps in different lo locations to kind of get a good sense of how Maggie would move around in the world. But she tends to be a little bit more fact-based. So, um, you know, I, I try to ground her in what I know to be, you know, the truth. And, and I do a lot of research with her. Um, and I tend to do that a little bit too with Lenora, although I can't walk around Google Maps in the 1860s. But, um, you know, she, she's a little bit more fact-based, even though she has a supernatural twist, she can communicate with the dead. So she sees souls and nice. she can talk to them. Um, and so she's kind of gothic in two senses. Um, as far as uh, world building for probably the one that's the most fantastical is going to be Shadow Slayers. And that is a world that is ever changing. So as um, I have ideas in my head, but as things come up, you know, there's there's different things that happen. So you never know what's going to happen in their story. Um, at this point, you know, the Shadow Slayers have been um, they've been into the past. They've been into parallel universes. They've been into other worlds. So they'll go to places like Mirror World or Shadow World. Um, they can pull people out of Mirror World. You can pull your twin out of the a doppelganger out of the mirror. Um, they can do things like go into these um, worlds where these other creatures exist. So they have, um, there's a big hierarchy um, in Shadow Slayers where, you know, there's creatures like adjudicators that kind of are like judges of the supernatural world. They, they come down and settle arguments between the supernatural creatures and they like to vacation in this very harsh environment. And so they, you know, the Shadow Slayers will go in and out of there if they have to um, need a place to find an adjudicator or something like that. And they've been to alternate universes where they have faced the consequences of a different set of choices that people have made and it's led to a very different landscape so that one is very fluid um the other worlds are a little bit um less fluid so you know once kate's little world of dunhaven was created it was kind of created and we don't get tons of extra things coming in she pretty much stays in dunhaven she stays at her castle she solves the mysteries in that area um, with the exception of when the Shadow Slayers came in and, and Kate's mind was kind of blown by that. And she's still kind of <laughs> picking up the pieces from her fourth book of, I can't believe that these people exist and, and this actually happens. Um, but for the most part, you know, again, they came to her. She didn't leave her world. So, so that world is really well established. Maggie travels all over. She's a little bit more realistic. So she, um, you know, I do a great deal of research in, into what things look like, feel like, smell like, sound like. Um, wherever she's going to go. And, um, you know, Lenora is obviously in the past. So, and I write her as though um, it's the 1860s. Now I try not to go overboard because people are, not, you know, are, they're reading for pleasure for the most part. They're not, you know, reading to be stuck in a place they can't understand um, people's dialogue and things like that. But she does speak very formally, you know, her characters. So it, she narrates like it's the 1860s for the most part. So I do try to immerse people in the world that way uh, too. But yeah, it depends, really depends on the series. But, you know, the, the landscape probably comes along, um, particularly in the Shadow Slayers as needed. And, and it's, it's very fluid, which bothers some readers. Some readers love it. It, it is it's all over the place. I mean, it's in a, in a, in the greatest, greatest way possible. It's like taking a grand road trip without a map, you know, it's like, I know we're going to, we're going to just go this direction. We're going to get there hopefully eventually, but who knows how we're going to get there, but you know, in, in time. Um, no, that's, that's kind of great. I like how it unfolds as you need it, you know, and, and, but in that, in that aspect, but your other series, this is a grounded reality. So you, you're catering to your series, to your, to your subject, uh, how much, I guess, grounding that you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the Shadow Slayers, because of the nature of the cosmic nature of their, of their, of their travels, I mean, uh, different planes of reality and different universes kind of thing, then it, all bets are off. I mean, you really can't, right. other than once you've introduced something, then 
unless that in and of itself is a changing universe, then that's how you're creating as you're going. You're just like throwing stuff out there like, yeah, why not? You know, in an infinite number of universes and realities, everything goes, you know, um, that's awesome. Um, okay. We've, you've talked a lot about developing your characters. It sounds like when you think about your place in your character, you said the characters talk to you and, and that's how they kind of tell you their story. So of all your characters you have ever created, which one would you like to sit down and have a drink with? I'm going to go with a choice that probably would not be that popular for people, but I'm going to go with my villain in the Shadow Slayer story, Duke Marcus Northcott. He is one of the most interesting characters I've written. Um, and, and it's because you get to do those fun things with him because he's kind of the bad guy, you know, yeah, he's the resident yeah. bad boy. And what's funny is as people go through that series, you know, they, they start out and, and he appears in the Kate Kenzie series when the shadow slayers come over and people were like, oh my gosh, he's the worst person ever. And when you first see him, people are very adamant about how much they detest this man. And as you move through the series, I've had people, I've had people actually message now message me on Facebook through um, my, my Facebook page for Nelly. And they're like, is it bad that I kind of like Marcus? And I'm like, no, it's, it's fine because he's a very multifaceted character. And, and I, I kind of think that um, working with our villains, um, you know, for the most part, we, we need to make them real people too. And, and villains have moments where they do wonderful things and villains have moments where they do really terrible things. Right. So they weren't um, always horrible people. Right. Something usually happened or something because that's right. part of the intrigue. Like what makes them what drives what them? them? What's their fit? motivation? Right, exactly. Exactly. Yes. And, 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 um, and I think he's one of the most interesting characters that, that I've written. And, and people are seeing kind of cracks in the facade of I'm supposed to hate this guy. Um, because I had, I had always intended him to, you know, to kind of have this, this very um, varied um, kind of set of not only skills, because he's one of the most powerful um, enemies that, you know, we've seen. But he also has this other side to him too, where, where people were like, I can't believe he did that. Like he, he didn't, he didn't actually just outright kill that person. Or, you know, there, there are other things that, that happen that kind of show you cracks in, in the, in the evil facade, if you will. And um, he's one of the more interesting characters. And he's one of the ones that gets to have all those fun soap opery dialogues, you know, sure. and when he cracks a joke, it's like, scene stopping because this is like there's a there's a line in i think it's in book three where um he'll say to one of the characters because he's he's actually interacting with one of our our good guy characters and um the good guy character asks him something and he's like look it's not my first rodeo buddy you know and it's right. one of the most off the wall for him because he's this he's a he's a, a duke that nobody knows where he came from or how old he is because they're immortals so he could be hundreds of years old and he comes off with this very American line because at this point he has lived for hundreds of years and he's experienced all these things. And so he comes off with these very colloquial lines at times, like if the shoe fits, darling, you know, things like that. And, and so he, yeah. He's a very unique persona. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Writing villains, a good villain is delicious. You mm -hmm. know, um, I, I, and I have a character in my cozy series. I don't know if she... I, she's a villain's too strong of a word but she's very haughty you know and like don't you know who i am i mean she's self-important mm -hmm. in this little town um, because of her stature and her husband and uh, she thinks very highly of herself you know and the way i described her is that you know she's fadingly pretty with this beautiful voluminous like black hair and and she's always making sure that people notice her you know right. and and she has to be called by all three names you know not just her first name you have to address her you know and and she has several runs with the main character you know to the embarrassment of the main character like oh you know uh, who's been gone for a long time and then she finds out she's look, being looked down upon don't you know who i am and that line just kind of came to me like mm -hmm. that was the first thing you hear from this character and i just kind of had an idea about her but like to start writing her i'm like oh okay mm -hmm. i get her and and then when i when i was writing my my last pulp um i knew i i had a villain and once i realized i knew what the villain was who the villain was but i hadn't really thought about him that much but like the first line came out of his head and it was just it was just effortless like oh i know who this mm -hmm. character is immediately and he's just so 
so arrogant and cocky in the best way and and very sardonic and and um like uh, satirical you know and mm -hmm. just like condescending in the best way possible so i was like because the book could be a one-off but i'm like no 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 this character's too good i i can't i can't kill this character off i have to make him an ongoing protagonist because he's just too fun to write you know so <laughs> no, i i completely get it that's 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 wonderful um your creative process because you're a pantser uh, again it, it blows my mind uh because you know as an academic i i not only grew up with very like you know you have an idea you develop it and then you organize it i mean learning how to write academic papers um and my master's thesis and then i was an english comp teacher for a couple of decades so i'm teaching my students to develop an outline and 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 that helps your drafting and all these things so i i, I walk the walk you know so let me i'd like to know more about your creative process from you know not just not just plotting although totally bring it up but from the beginning of like an idea the kernel of an idea how how do you go about you know developing something into where it, this is a fall you know a full-blown product so um and and this is probably another thing that it's it's a little bit series specific but not really because i'm a pantser on almost on all of them um but like for Lenora, the, the thing that um, speaks the most to me on there is, is Lenora herself. So this is a first person. This was the only one I write in first person right now. Um, and, and I literally can hear her telling me the story. It's her voice in my head. It's not my voice. It's her voice in my head saying, this is what happened. This is what happened. And, and she's another one. One of her characters got away from me. So I had intended, um, you know, because as much as I'm a pantser, I do have like, overarching things in mind when i begin a book okay do you um, write them down like organizationalized like do you take sometimes notes and I will. Them? okay sometimes i let them kind of brew for a little bit and then sure. see what comes out on the page and and this was one of those i thought she was gonna she was an orphan she was marrying a duke and i thought he's gonna be dead by chapter five and she's gonna be alone in this massive castle he's still alive it's the end of book two he's going into book three he's <laughs> still going strong he did not want to die. Um, she did not want him to die. And so, you know, I, I, the, I completely changed the landscape of the story because I hadn't intended, uh, I had intended for her to be alone in this massive castle um, after, you know, he passed away shortly after marrying her and that did not happen at all. Um, so those are the, the types of things. And it's similar with the pirate story. I had intended them to just kind of you know, tell a little bit of how they became, you know, Cliff became a pirate and, and they lived and died and that was the end of it. And that very quickly did not happen. I hemmed and hawed for a long time about what was going to happen there because I tried to fight them a little bit to grab my story back. And they were like, nope, this is what's going to happen. Um, but, you know, I, I usually have like a kernel of an idea. It can come from anywhere, surprisingly. Um, you know, when I write Kate Kenzie, it's, um, it's, her big deal is that she goes back and forth she time travels so she you know goes back and forth um in different time periods so it's like what time period do i think would be cool to visit is usually where my idea starts the last one the one that i'm actually working on now book five um i i was going through stock music to do a book trailer to pick music for a book trailer and happened upon this song and was like okay this is the idea for book five so it's this song that we're going to go with it, it sounds like a music box so there's a music box involved with the, with the story and that's pretty much all I had. And then it, it just comes from there. Um, you know, and when I really get into it, uh, and I really, you know, get into a scene, I don't know necessarily where the scene's going to go. And sometimes it just blossoms from me putting myself in there with the character and letting the character kind of dictate where they're going to go and what they're going to do. Um, so, you know, I, and I usually have an idea kind of, this is where I'm going to start. And this is maybe where I want to end up. And whatever happens in the in-between there is a mystery, <laughs> even okay. to me as I write. Um, and then as I start writing, um, you know, I'll be like, oh, okay, I can get this scene and this scene and this scene, and I'll start to fill in, in the landscape. But I, I generally have like, like a start to finish or even like a series arcing, like I know, like I knew that I wanted to bring the Shadow Slayers in when I started writing book two of Kate Kenzie. I was like, I know I want to bring these people together at some point. 
And I, I couldn't wait to write that book. That was one of my most fun writes because um, I was throwing all these people together. They were getting to meet each other. Um, and I had been excited about it since I published the, the first book and knew that I was going to do this. So I do have like long-term ideas. How we get there though is, is a matter of... Um, what TV show you're watching at the time, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, that, that's great. Uh, now, would you, jumping back and forth in time, do you then, obviously as an academic, you're comfortable with doing research. So do you do research for these books like ahead of time? Or when you find out something like, oh, we're going back to this time, this era, I probably should know something that, you know, because the, the good is in the details or God is in the details, depending on, on your point of view. So, so do you do research? And if so, what kind of research do you do? I do. A lot of it that I'll do is um, like what I call just in time research, because I, you know, sometimes will not know that I'm going to suddenly be, um, you know, going to this specific place or doing this specific thing. So then like when I hit that moment in the story, it's like, I got to know more. So, you know, I start Googling, I start reading, I start figuring out other, uh, I start watching um, programs about it and things like that to, to learn more. Um, I start walking around on Google Maps in some cases to see what, you know, what this place may look like or, you know, a, a similar place that I may want to invent. Um, so I, I do, um, some of it's not done ahead of time, but I was also um, a history minor in my college days. So history was something that I loved and something that, you know, that I watched the History Channel a lot. I, you know, I watched um, those types of programs all the time. So I have a lot to pull from. So I'll kind of be like, yeah, okay, maybe we want to go to, you know, World War II era. And then I'll start looking into it, researching what elements do I want to bring in? Um, you know, in, in my latest Maggie story that I just finished writing, you know, I was um, sending her on a vacation to Scotland and which is going to not be very much of a vacation for poor Maggie, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, it was like, what types of, of, of lore and legend can I get her into? Cause she's been into Cleopatra's tomb. She's been into the library of Alexandria mystery. Um, and what I'll often do, like what I did for the Library of Alexandria is there's often these like little kernels of a story out there that just need expanded. So, you know, for example, um, you know, for the most part, the, they kind of know the Library of Alexandria was destroyed and fires and, and, and yeah. just general waning and things like that. But there are people, you know, who write articles on the fact that they never found a structure that would match what this massive library should have looked like. And so that's where the kernel of the story starts. Well, oh, here, because, the, you know, uh, the conspiracy theory is, oh my gosh, we've never found the ruins of the Library of Alexandria. Yeah, 300,000 books have been lost to right, time. Which right. means, where did they go? Um, and, you know, and, and Maggie's story is finding out what happened and, and why they never found the ruins of the Library of Alexandria where they expected it. You've given me an idea now about that. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna write. I'm not gonna steal your idea, but but <laughs> I, I I totally get that though because I the kernel of the idea, yeah. How that one thing, because my and my it, it, my fantasy went right to this place where who the conspiracy was correct. There was a building that burned. It was not, but whoever this the real Alexandria has been. You know, someone's been care, keeping care of it and reading all the books. It's like a wizard like absorbing mm -hmm. all this information over thousands of years. And now is like this all powerful, almost like a deity, you know, kind of thing. Right. So no, that's fantastic. I love that. Um, sorry to interrupt. It was just, no, that's okay. Because that's thought, how it happens though. Right. I, yes. You get and this kernel of an idea yeah. and everybody's is different. Like your mind went to a different place than my sure. mind went to. And, and, um, and it, it, that's, that's the beauty of, of reading all of these different authors ideas mm -hmm. is that, you know, um, you know, some people will come on and say, oh, this, this book was stupid because, you know, I didn't like that the character did that or whatever, but that was that person's character and every story, you know, has the right to be told, I think. Yeah. Um, not, and, you can, and as a writer, you can't, you can't ultimately worry about what the audience is going right. to like or not. I mean, I know writers who have attempted to write for the audience wants and needs, but then they're never happy because they're always trying right. to like be one step ahead. Like I got to make them happy. It's like, and, and, and I, I don't take up a lot of advice from other writers, but some people who have, who have done earned it. I, I listen to like Stephen King has a lot of stuff to say about writing and like, 
the one thing I hold on to is like, I, you know, write for yourself. It doesn't matter who else. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I have to be happy with what I write. I hope other readers like it. I hope something resonates with them. But if I'm not happy with it, then, then why, then why have I spent all that time, right. you know, writing? And so ultimately I write, it's a very selfish kind of act in that regard, but it's just, that's what makes it so more pleasing. If someone else enjoys it, that that's kind of the best thing in the world, you know? Um, but, but the research, I like that aspect that you have some of that planning. If you know where you're going to go, that you do some of that planning and you don't have to do a lot of it. Just, mm -hmm. a, just a few things to kind of ground it in that reality. Um, my second book is a splatter Western it takes place right after the civil war. I, I just wanted to, um, know a little bit about what was going on in the states at the time mm -hmm. uh, the characters from ohio he was sent to a prison in hell arizona which i invented hell arizona but i looked up arizona the history of arizona and knew that they were you know the confederates uh, had had were there in, in in full power in during the civil war and i learned about the weapons of the time and the like the mail routes from the you know mm -hmm. and and the, just learning the, the kind of stuff that would probably come up at some point in time in the telling of the story but not so much to where it was like bogged down from the telling because it's at the heart it's a splatter western it's just grim tale of revenge right. but i want uh, but i'm not i want to make sure that the the pistols and the and the rifles and the right. coach mm -hmm. guns those all have to be authentic because as a historical historical fiction uh you have to have those right because readers are going to know like hey that, that that weapon doesn't come out until you know 1885 you can't have that you know and it's, so it's out of respect for that and like when i did death's head my pulp horror being taking place around haiti and about voodoo and zombies i needed to know that when i wrote these loa you know the eye of samity it's the samity the head the head loa i wanted to make sure out of respect for the religion that i was writing the character right. correctly and 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 with reverence because this is someone's religious belief i'm not i'm not being mocking i want to get the character right and the more i research the more like, this this character i mean samity is he's a jokester he's a trickster he's a he's so fun that that's it made it joyous but mm -hmm. I, as the academic in me, I love research. I, I still enjoy learning all that. Mm -hmm. And it's being able to put it into your story in somewhat of a seamless way. That's what makes it, I think, fun to be able to put these things in without being so heavy handed. Right. You know, it's just this is part of the reality. So you give people the reality and, and, and without them really even knowing they're getting a little bit of a history lesson in a, in a way with without knowing or thinking I'm, I'm not watching a documentary no it's an entertaining story but the facts and the tidbits are going to be accurate and, and i think right. you have to do that if you're going to be writing in different times you know yeah definitely and and i think that that was one of the fun things in in the kate four novel that you know she she's going to the 1700s in that novel to visit one of her ancestors and um one of the things that comes up is she, she has a, she has a few journals of his and the journals are encrypted and so she is, which is something that I've studied as a mathematician is encryption and cryptography. And so I brought that knowledge in and, you know, I had to brush up a little bit, but I had that knowledge and I brought it in and it was amazing because she tries to solve this code and she does have to go get a mathematician to help her. And, you know, he kind of talks a little bit because he's, he's a fellow professor from her old um, professor days. And he talks a little bit about, oh, I'm sorry, I sound like a professor here, but I, you know, here's what I'm trying and here's why. And, and so we get into a little bit of cryptography in that book. And, um, you know, people that, that would never take a cryptography class were fascinated by the code. And they were like, I was sitting there trying to figure out the code. Like, was it a cryptogram? Was, what was she doing? You know, was it a substitution cipher? And I was looking things up and I was running it through and I was going through the process with Kate that she goes through. And that's one of the most fun things I think is you can put those details in and people can like latch onto them and learn something that they, they haven't learned, even though it's a fictional world, um, that, that there are some details that we do ground, um, you know, in, in reality. So, you know, I had to, I had to look up when specific ciphers were, you know, were common and, and what was used and what could have been used and, mm -hmm. and how can I modify it to fit the century and things like that. So sure. it, it's a fascinating process. And, and I enjoy learning those little factual tidbits and, and things like that. So it's fun for me. Yeah. Well, if you ever do another dark, a dark, like suspense thriller fantasy with that character, um, I don't know, 
you could maybe have her work on the uh, Gemini ciphers, you know, right? Uh, which still remain unsolved. I mean, there have been many theories, but none have been proven mm -hmm. to be true. So honestly, no one really knows, um, even though a handful of people have been come forward and said, no, it was my uncle. My grandpa was the, yeah. the Gemini killer. And, you know, with all this evidence, and there's like four or five stories of men who could be the Gemini, or some that are very compelling, um, you know, especially the one who was in the army and did cryptography and right. learned ciphers. I'm like that, that, that's pretty compelling. Um, no, that so I love that. That's that's great. And and I know other writers who write fantasy because they don't want to do the research. Like they can just invent it up, mm -hmm. which, which I I get too. But you, there still has to be a consistency and a grounding in a reality of itself. You still have to create a reality that. Right. It works, whether it's mirror universes or whether it's gothic castles, um, you know, you still have to have a reality that's consistent with itself. And um, so that's that's great. Your process of sitting in front of the TV and writing, I would I would it would be so I, I probably couldn't do it because I would just be. You know, I, my process is so different. I mean, I got to be in my room. It's got to be, I have to have a certain block of time. I need to have my music on. So do you have a favorite time of day to write? Because if you're sitting in front of the TV, you could like, you could be writing any time of the day. I, and I sometimes do. Um, I, I have, I started writing in the evenings um, because, you know, I was, I still work full time uh, as a college professor. So, you know, I spend a lot of my evenings writing and then, um, as I kind of progress through my career, I, I have mostly online courses now, which means that I have asynchronous courses. So I'm basically fielding questions all day long, um, which frees up my time to go back and forth between projects. So, uh, you know, now I find that, you know, depending on the story, um, I, I may work a little bit in the morning. Um, I'll do a little bit in the, in the late afternoon. And now I've been kind of reading in the evenings because I have my new blog where I, you know, do reviews for authors, um, especially indie authors who are looking to, to kind of build those reviews up and be featured. Um, but, you know, uh, I took the weekend and I did writing um, in morning, afternoon and night. So I did like an intensive write of writing weekend this last weekend. Um, and I, I wrote at all times of the day. Um, I don't know if there's a favorite time for me, probably my afternoon sessions are my most difficult because, you know, my, my brain is a little bit slower because I'm not fresh in the morning. I'm one of those people that's like super fresh in the morning eh, in the afternoon, and then really like raring to go at night, the brain can't shut off. Yes. So, yes. you know, uh, in the morning I, I, you know, hit my word counts pretty easily afternoon. I'm like, looking on Facebook, right? right. A little bit. Looking the on after Facebook. lunch, you get all logy, like, of, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And then in the evening, of course, the inspiration starts hitting and I'm like writing until bedtime. Right. Yeah. Um, and hopefully the mind will, will shut off. But um, yeah, I, 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 I have, the one thing I have learned though, is to write every day. Okay. Um, and that's something that, you know, that people kind of don't believe um, authors do, or, you know, actually, actually, uh, do, but that is the thing that the consistency was really the key for me. And even if it, whether it was morning, afternoon, or evening, get those 500 words in, or get those thousand words in, or whatever your daily goal is. And it doesn't have to be huge. Um, but writing every day has trained me to push through those tough story points where you're like, okay, she just had breakfast. What's she going to do now? You know, or, or like I just finished a major scene and now I need to write those few paragraphs where she doesn't really do anything, but you can't simply leave her at the end of the scene and then go, you know, the, you know two days later, you know, Kate's doing this. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are things that you have to push through and writing every day is something that, that I've learned helps push through those. Cause you just have to do it. You just have right. to sit down and, and, you know, finished is, is, is better than perfect. Um, because that's the other thing people mm -hmm. struggle with. Well, this isn't perfect. It's never going to be. It's never going to be. You, you come to yeah. a point of diminishing returns and mm -hmm. that, that mentality prevents you from going on and creating other things. Exactly. And, and yes, I, I completely get that. And sometimes even though, you know, the, um, the consistency is key, even, even though, you know, you sit down and you realize what I write today is probably not going to be any good. It's almost irrelevant because mm -hmm. it's, it's like you get it out of the way then. Or sometimes when you know when you're writing, you know something is not gonna fit in one work. You write it anyway, because you can always cannibalize it 
for later on. And that's, that's one of the things that nothing can be, nothing has to be wasted. You know, right. it's just getting it out there in the process. And that's one thing that I struggle with. Well, I'm back in grad school uh, and I'm doing podcasts. Like my creative life has taken other directions. And sometimes it depends. You know, I, I, I did other things. I did academic stuff, did a lot of academic writing that I made some movies and now I'm doing long fiction and now I'm doing three podcasts. And so there's all this, uh, speaking of changing lanes, creatively, creatively, um, sometimes I want to write, like, I got these stories. They're telling me, you got to finish me. But I'm like, I'm doing so many other things right now. And it's just a trade-off. Like for now, my effort's going here, but my stories, I'm still going to finish them. They're, they're you know, um, but no, I, but I get that consistency is key. And, and, mm-hmm. and uh, whether you keep it or not, it's just that the habit of writing is very important. I, I right. completely understand. Um, okay. Tell me how you felt seeing your book in print for the first time, like holding it in your hands. How was, what was that experience? Yeah. It was amazing. Um, I, I can still recall it because I think I ripped the box open on the way back up the driveway because I knew what was in there. And it was, you know, it was my author proof copy of The Secret of Dunhaven Castle. And, um, and I, I knew it was coming. And, you know, it was one of those, like I ordered it from Amazon. I was looking out the window. Um, is it here yet? Is it here yet? Um, and they're pretty good about telling you when it's like six stops away. So I knew and like I ran out to the mailbox to get it. Like the ice cream um, man's coming. You hear the yes. ice cream truck's coming. Like, I'm going to get a snow. Yeah. I'm going to get a screw. And, and I can't, I don't know if I can, you know, I'm not, I don't think I'm a, as good of a writer that I can fully capture the emotions that I felt in that moment when I opened that book and I saw the words I had written on the page. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that, that, that I'm, I'm that good of a writer to capture that. It was amazing. I mean, it was, it was a life changing moment. Yeah. And then for me, it was because I had five beta readers and editors to go along with me. It, my joy quickly turned to horror um, when I saw those first couple typos, like, oh no, yes. you know, and I started, get, people were buying it, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and then sending me pages like, hey, you got a typo here. I'm like, oh, you know, that that though changed the how I viewed it because I did all my editing on the screen and but they they always say look get your author copy there's a reason you have the author proof read it right. because mm-hmm. you will find mistakes there on the page that you don't see on the screen and um you know I was completely ignorant of the process my first book through it's like but now I know better I, I get that author proof I was like oh okay and I'm getting better every time I go through, but I thought for sure five people reading this, they're going to bound to have caught all the mistakes. You know? Right. No. I had, yeah, I had like um, <laughs> six people read through it and they, you know, it's true what they say. The fastest way to find your typos is to hit publish because <laughs> yes. as soon as you hit the publish button, there they all are. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yes. I know. I'm like, I remember I was like, it was a summer before last, I think, and, and a book that had been out for like six months. And I'm like reading it again, because that, that's something else I wanted to ask you about. I'm reading it like just just like there's a weird it's, it's a very transcendent, bizarre experience to read a book that you've written like a year or yeah. so, year or two after you've written it. Because for me, anyway, it was like, I, I know I wrote these words because I was the one writing them, but I don't remember like mm-hmm. what I wrote. It was just like reading someone else's work. It was like being in two states, two bodies at the same time, like a, like a dream state where you see yourself in your dream. Right. Um, and, and I, so I'm reading this book. I'm like, Oh, you know, some of this is actually pretty good. I'm like, Oh, shit, there's an error. I gotta, I gotta find that. Like, and so I'm like, okay, I found two mistakes. And I had to go back into KDP and go, okay, where's my document? Fix mm-hmm. these two upload it again. Like, you know, and you feel like a moron, but, um, <laughs> what are the, have you read your early books like a couple years yeah, later? Yeah, I like- have. And it is an odd experience. And I think it's because, you know, and they, they tell you this when you start writing that, you know, 10 books, 20 books, 30 books along the way that your writing will transform, that you will grow as a writer. And it's true that you do. And so sometimes I cringe a little bit when I read the first few books. <laughs> Um, but the, you know, the, the thing is the stories are there and I still enjoy some of those stories that I told. 
Um, and and I think I think the other thing, the other way that 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 uh, you can kind of catch typos and, and is very odd the first few times you do it is um, I, I have mine created into audiobooks <laughs> and hearing someone read your work to you. Uh, first of all, you can it's like there's the typo right there, you know. Um, as you're reading through and proving their work. What is, what is Flogganugan yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, hearing someone bring your story to life, um, and and sometimes you know, for me, depending on on the schedule that my narrators have, uh, it, it can be a month, a few months after, and I'm like, wait, did I write this? <laughs> you know, it is one of those deals where I'm like, I, I remember, like, obviously I wrote it, but I don't remember, you know, this this right. particular part or what's going on or, um, but. Yeah, you know, it, it can be an interesting experience to go back, not only, you know, to see the difference um, in your writing and your mm -hmm. writing style, which there definitely is, um, but to see kind of the innocence of those first few stories that you told. Sure. Um, sure. You know, the, the first few times you put yourself on the page and, and you know, what that meant to you. And, and you can almost kind of see yourself holding back a little bit um, because, you know, you're, you've, you've put things out there, but you know, in, in my books now, like I'm like going for it. And if it doesn't work, the beta readers will tell me and I'll you know, right. pull back a little bit. But in the first few books, I think I kind of was so um, intensely worried about making, um, making, you know, grammar proper and people sound like they were talking correctly and things like that. And, and now I found that, you know, that people, people don't talk like that. Like dialogue needs to sound like people talking. Right. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've adjusted and I've taken, you know, the feedback from people who haven't liked the book and, you know, some people don't like the book, they don't like the book, but some people say, you know, well, the thing was I had a trouble getting through the dialogue because it was like, you know, she said, he said, she said, he said, and it's like, okay, good point. I put way mm -hmm. too many saids in this novel or something like that. So, you know, I've right. learned from the process. And so going back um, and reading your early work can somewhat be horrifying in some instances but i think there's also an innocence about it there's there's this this idea that you were you know putting this story out there for the world to read and and i think there's something special about that yeah well you're doing something that a lot of people say they want to do but very few do mm -hmm. and i i forget the writer who says this but there's a he said people who say i wish i were a writer really meant i wish i would have written like i wish it was already done because the act of writing right. can be challenging it's hard it's mundane it's laborious you know and there are times it's just like for me, when I hit about 75% done with a novel or the draft, I'm ready for it to be over. Like it is a slog fest that last quarter is like, Ugh. because I've already played the end out in my mind a thousand right. times. Yep. It's like, I know it, but you have to write one word at a time. You're building the great wall one brick at a time, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, no, I, I, I totally, I totally get that. And, and there are times because all my books have been like kind of not one shots, but the first ofs. So when I went back to write my sequel to my cozy, about three months had passed in the story. It's a four story uh, mysteries. That's all one for each season. So there was a winter book. Now it's the spring. So I, I knew only a few months had passed in, in the character, but when I came to it, it was a little apprehension, like, mm -hmm. okay, it, you always get that. Like, is this, was this like a fluke? Like, did I do something that I can't do any better or something? Mm -hmm. But like, once I kind of got in, like the first couple sentences in, I realized, okay, I feel like I'm back in this world again. I'm back with this characters again. I, the only difference was, is I felt more confident in my prose than I did right. in the first one. And I kind of wrote about that in the first book where this scene where you know, because Abby comes home and she's just lost her job. She was a teacher who lost her job and she's just trying to find herself. And so I'm using Maslow's hierarchy of needs throughout the book as her long story arc. And she's trying to reach self-actualization. So her first book is on that base level. She's trying to find a job and have her needs met. And now the second book she's evolved, she has those met. So now she's working in the Lex level up, which is relationships and connections and trying to figure this out. And she's a character who's in her head an awful lot. So the narrator goes back from this omniscient narrator to her, like she finishes sentences, you know, in her mm -hmm. own, in her own inner monologue. So I wanted to kind of play with that sense of this murkiness of, of the, the messiness of relationships. And also it ties into spring. The early spring is so messy. It's the leftovers of winter. It's all dead and yucky. And everyone focuses on, you know, Oh, Easter, Easter. There's, this is all, this is a lot of good Friday, you know, um, mm -hmm. before 
you, but you can't ignore the spring tropes. You have to, you know, I'm writing a seasonal book. I have to bring those in. But for me, it was a lot of fun to kind of play with that sense of murkiness. Like in the first book, she's trying to deal with her depression and figuring out what to do. So all these kind of imagery, it put a parallel, my like not knowing what to do with this book. This is my first book. I've written movies, I've written other things, but never a novel. And so her imagining like swimming through this like dark and trying to find herself without knowing is there an alien shore at the end? Is there a light? I can't see anything. I don't know how to get from where I am to where I want to be. There's no, there's no guideline. That was me as a writer, like mm-hmm. hoping that I'm, I'm getting somewhere. I have an outline. I've got 16 page outline. It's color coded. I know what I want to tell, but am I doing it successfully? Am I going to do it? And so that was, that was a nice parallel to be able to bring in. And so, um, but, but I, I, I like, I, say all that to uh to say that now that she's transitioned uh into this next book and as i've transitioned into my fifth i'm bringing my own self-confidence like yeah i'm a lot more confident of a writer into the thing but it's still now i'm more mindful of other things like less Mm -hmm. about my active writing but okay is my story compelling is this Am I still going to tell a story that people are going to want to read? You know, is this still the same thing? I guess there's always those insecurities going into it, but I like the idea of keep having a story evolve in the same town with same characters and adding new ones. That that's really intriguing for me. I I like that process. So for you who've written a lot of stories in these same places with these uh, characters, how did it feel going back into like from your first book into your second, into your third, how was the, the emotional, I guess, the emotional relationship that you had between your active writing and this sequels within a series? You know, I think the most fun part for me of going back and like looking at the progression, and, and I would say this consistently happens in, in most of the series that I've written, especially the ones that I've got like four books out in, is that not only can you see, and I, and I, I think it parallels what you said, not only can you see the the development of the writing, but you see the development of the character. So it's almost like me on the page, right? Because, you know, and, and it was interesting when you said, you know, she's kind of feeling her way through and you felt like that as a writer. And, you know, a, a large portion of Kate's first book is Kate on this journey, which is what I was on too. You know, I was um, starting here and trying to get to my Scottish, Scottish castle in Scotland. And, and it was a process. And, and I think her journey kind of mirrors that idea of going into the unknown. And, um, and that's a big part of the first book. And I know hardcore mystery readers are the ones that will ding me on this. And they'll be like, it took her forever to get to Scotland. And I'm like, but it takes us forever to get to our goals too. Sure. Um, and, and that's something that I want people invested in. I want people, you know, to be invested in in the character and how much they mm-hmm. need to grow and how much unknown they need to face. And that was a big right. part of her first book. You can't but ignore the you, journey. I mean, the, yeah. you can't ignore that. The, the right. The journey is what makes the what makes the end. Right. You know, it it it's like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> you know, the, you have the beginning. They get the ring, and at the last five pages, they throw it into the to the mountain. Right. And you got a thousand pages of of the journey. Of just you know, the journey. it's like yep. it's the road trip is not the destination. It's right. what happens, you know. And th- I think I wonder if people forget that that there is something grand and, and good about the journey. And that's the messy part, though. The messy yeah. part is the journey. And I, I that was something I bring up in the the first like it's like it's like being in a liminal stage. You know, you're between, right. um, and that's the in between that is the messy part and not knowing how you're going to get there. But that's where all the stuff happens, that who you are at the end of that journey is directly the cause of what happens during the journey. Right. You know, the hero's story. This is this is how the hero becomes the hero or the villain becomes the villain. It's and what happens yeah. in the journey. And I think that, that the thing is, and this is this is like what I noticed throughout my series is that, um, you know, these characters evolve um, and there's you know, if you would read them start to finish, um, and, and, you know, even though I, I kind of didn't write them like from one book, one book, two book, three, you know, I went back and forth with different series, you will see kind of the maturing of the characters. 
Um, and in a way it's the maturing of me as a writer too, but you will see them evolve and you will see them change. And if you didn't have those first few rough moments of the journey, you know, you wouldn't know how awkward Kate was, or you wouldn't know how innocent Damien was before he became involved in the supernatural world. You wouldn't see the, you know, why Celine acts the way she acts or you know why Lenora tends to be guarded and and you need to have those moments with the characters those rough moments that aren't the most exciting they aren't the most actiony but they're what drives the overall character arc from like i said you know just kate to lady kate uh -huh. and you know damien the introverted uh, software engineer to damien the shadow slayer who is risking his life who is you know on the brink of death at several moments who is saving other people from death and you really need to see you know his journey from you know the guy who works from home um fixing other people's errors in code to the guy who's you know um pulling somebody back off of a cliff in another universe i mean yeah. uh, and and i think that 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 is what um, what sticks with me, what resonates with me is is that you can actually see the change in these characters as they move through the series, um, and and I, I it's not by accident, you know. Definitely, I've read enough series to know that characters you know need to have growth, they need to have overall um, story goals and 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 things like that. But it, it's also the maturing of your writing. Mm -hmm. And the maturing of you kind of bringing the characters, letting them settle into their world and then, you know, letting them um, mature on their own a little bit. Right. Yes. It, it is a, the parallels is a reflection of, of the creative ability to create um, and, mm -hmm. and your, the potency you have at, at honing your craft, you know, as you go. And um, so I know I like that. I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one who felt that sense of confidence going in the second book because the other books, again, they're all all different genres. Mm -hmm. And so it was still like a first of its kind. Um, but this one was the first time I noticed a, a confidence in in my craft. And so not to be pretentious, um, but I've just felt more comfortable writing. Like, oh, okay. Now I know there are things I... I'm really cognizant now, like there are two characters I've introduced really, and I know I need to, I've tried to flesh them out, but they, they seem flat. So I'm already cognizant mm -hmm. of like these two characters need to work over. And the, you know, those are, those are things I have to be mindful of, but that's okay. It's just getting it out there. So my, my rough structure, my rough draft is going to be better and yeah. I can go back and, and, you know, but still I'm, I'm feeling good about how I write. And so that's, that's exciting as for me, my own personal growth as a writer. So, um, because I have two other series that I'm working on the second books for as well. So my next splatter Western is coming out after this one. So I'm, I'm confident like going into it, like, okay. So it, it kind of propels itself in a way, which makes me excited to, to keep on writing. So I just have a few more questions I'd like yeah. you to ask then, but you know, I won't keep you all day. Um, what is your writer fantasy? If you have one, if you could like say, yeah, this is, this is my ultimate dream as a writer. This is what I want. You know, I really, and I know this is going to sound cliched, but I'd really love to see my work on screen. I think they'd be great Hallmark movies. <laughs> um, you know, I think Kate Kinsey is, is a great Hallmark um, kind of gal. Um, you know, of course, Maggie Edwards, I'd love to see an Indiana Jones style movie there, but, um, and I know that's something that lots of writers talk about, but I think, you know, growing up watching um, in the TV generation and watching a lot of TV and, and watching, I know there are people that are visual people and I'm certainly one of them. I mean, like I said, I, I watch TV while I'm writing um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm a firmly a believer that TV is not something that just rots your brain. You can learn from it. You can be entertained by it. And uh, just as much as, you know, somebody who's, who's, who's reading a book. And so I think to be able to share that with a new set of people, to be able to share the stories with a new set of people and, and to really see the stories come to life in terms of, um, you know, I, I describe the Scottish Highlands or I, I describe the, the desert sands, you know, when Maggie goes um, in search of Cleopatra's tomb, but to see that landscape kind of laid out visually, I think would be fantastic. Nice. Yeah, that's good. Um, my, my first cozy actually started off as a movie idea for Hallmark. 
And um, long story short, the because I didn't know they were looking for writers, um, I thought, oh, they're never going to want, you know. Uh, so I went on their site and I said, yeah, writers wanted them. Like, they were just starting their fiction um, branch. I'm like, oh. And I thought, well, I, why not? You know, so I turned this into a book, like in like 60 days, you know, and and then my cousin, I, who's an attorney, I said, well, you look over their, their their terms and conditions. Something doesn't seem quite right. And long story short, basically, they said anyone who submits books to them, they can keep and use any part they want because it's mm -hmm. a cozy mystery and uh, they don't have to. You know, you give up all your rights to um, like take them to court and for for plagiarizing. I'm like. Because, you know, everyone, so many people have similar ideas. So they're just taking the ideas. And I'm like, well, no, I'm not going to, why would I give you a book and then let right. you have all you want? Like, no. And then give up my rights to like get, you know, pay for it. So that's why I thought, no, I'll screw that. I'll just, I'll do indie publishing. So, but I get it. I mean, it, it is Hallmark friendly. It's, it's not, there's no murder. There's no blood. It's right. there's a mystery, but there's no blood. So no, I, I, I totally understand that. But um, no, that's a good fantasy. That's good. What advice would you give for anyone who wants to be a writer? Get into that routine of writing every day. And I, you know, this is something that I probably didn't think of or know of until, you know, somebody told me and people told me, and, and certainly there's this idea and it's, it's proliferated in movies and, and things like that in books um, of the writer who is like, writes when the moment strikes you know right. like the they're, muse they're, is gifting me i must yes, yes they drop their groceries <laughs> on the floor and they race in because they've got to get it down and i certainly do get that i mean there are times when i'm like crawling out of bed and i, I gotta get this down because it, you know i this is a fantastic thing i have to write it um but where the rubber meets the road for an author is getting all that mundanity done. Like you said, I mean, and, and my and my mom says this all the time. She goes, I love reading your books. I would never write one. It's too mundane for me. I can't imagine putting those little details in or those little tiny conversations that, you know, that not only further the plot, but also build the character. Um, and, and so I, I think you have to train yourself to do that. Um, otherwise, you know, the, if this idea of, well, I'll write when the mood strikes me, is great, but you're going to finish your book years from now. You're not going to get your stories out there and you're not going to get them finished. And, and that's something that I had to learn um, was that, you know, when it, the going gets tough, you got to keep pushing. Um, and the way that you do that is you train yourself to write every day and you train yourself to expect that every day. Otherwise, you know, there's a million excuses. Um, I had a headache today. I'm not going to write. I had to go out to the store today. I'm not going to write. Um, I had to, you know, th this thing broke and now my mind's on that and I'm not going to write. And those excuses are your roadblocks yeah. to a novel. To success. To right. You got to get through it. You got to, you got to yeah. kick yourself in the butt. Right. And like, like a journey it's always great that first part of writing mm -hmm. a story oh it's so exciting you know but by the time you're in the middle of it yeah in the money middle <laughs> yes and that's that's about where i had to stop writing uh my my current draft is because you know back in school full-time so you know but i still want to write it it's like okay but it's in that muddy middle um and now when i go back to it because it'll been have been some time I, I'm not going to be the same writer. I'm no, I'm not the same writer. And so it'll be, oh, there might be a spot like in the middle, like Mark, your prose has come changed. <laughs> you know, like, well, we'll figure it out as we go, you know, but um, speaking of work in progress, can you tell me about your work or do you have a work in progress that you can tell us about? I do. Um, I've actually got a couple of things going on right now. So um, I had a couple of kernels of ideas that, you know, and, and when you when you get the kernels of ideas, you start. And like you said, it's very exciting when you write the beginning. It can be very exciting when you write the end, but that muddy middle is the is the tough part. Um, I'm right in. I'm getting towards the end of writing um, book five for uh, Kay Kenzie. Um, and I've got two other projects going on right now, too. Um, I'm I'm kind of testing getting into two more uh, cozy mystery novellas. So um, I'm hoping to, you know, bring those out later this year or early next year, but I'm, I'm in the middle of those three projects. And, and I think when I did my little intensive writing weekend, I was flopping between the three, which sometimes helps um, because I can take a break from one landscape mm -hmm. and kind of paint a picture in another and then go back to the other landscape with a fresh sure. mind. 
Um, but I've got three works in progress right now, and we've got definitely more um, coming on the way. I've got stuff sitting, waiting to, to go into the editing process. So we'll have Maggie three coming out, Lenora two coming out um, later this year, Kate five, possibly a few more cozies. And um, we'll be hitting into Shadows five uh, soon too. Cause I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm bypassing the muddy middle. I'm getting towards the, uh, that last 25% of Kate Kenzie book five, which is always like the, the wrap up fun time and, and get, you know, like you said, slog through it, get to the next book or whatever. Yeah. But um, yeah, we've got lots of exciting things coming. That's fantastic. Um, I, I like that you have so many plates spinning, so many irons yeah. in the fire. I always get, you know, like I said, by the time I'm three quarters of the way into a book, you know, my mind's like wanting to start something else. Mm -hmm. And that's usually when that next book starts talking to me, yep. you know, like, three quarters away through my cozy gauge black that's my splatter western started like saying and i could hear his voice mm -hmm. you know i could hear him talking to me like i knew what he sounded like and it was like so pulling me like i was like almost tempted like yeah i'll, yeah. I'll write this i'll come back to you <laughs> you know um, i'm like no i know but it was good because it fueled that imagination i was able to just write down everything and I get, a, right. I have a notebook. I keep and just write it down. Yeah. And, the, and those portions of dialogue, even that I, that I would remember or would come to me that day, I just brought into the story later on when I, when I did write it. But, but I think it's good. You got to pay attention when those creative voices tell you, like, yeah. you, you know, and I, I like that, how you flip flop back and forth, because then you, you almost in a way sometimes avoid that necessarily, like you get so tired of the one thing and you're like, you know, you have to get through it. But if you can take a break from that, and, and do something else it, it does going to keep it you guys going to keep it more fresh perhaps right. as a writer since you are writing every day you, you have to do something that keeps that motivation there because right. otherwise it, it can be so easy to say oh, i really don't want to write that today well oh, i'm busy you know yeah, yeah exactly i get it i get it well is there anything else that you would like to promote today like i mean you've promoted i mean we got all kinds of things going um and if not then uh we could just tell us where can we find your books? Well, you can find my books in two places. You can either go to um, our website, which is www.anovelideapublishing.com. And you can also find them on my blog, which is uh, www.nelliesbooknook.com. And the one thing that I wanted to point out, um, actually, I'll, I'll point out two things. One, I have a readers group on Facebook. So if, you, if you're um, in, interested in learning more about characters, um, we do giveaways there and everything. Hop over to uh, the Nellie H. Steele Mystery Readers Group. Um, we'd be happy to have you. We do lots of fun things. We're having Kate Kenzie Month this month, celebrating Kate Kenzie. And Kate Kenzie is in the group. Kate Kenzie does come in and talk to people. So you can talk to Kate. Um, and the other thing is on my book nook, um, we actually have an interactive immersive site for people. So, so people get really into the landscape of, of um, that I've created all the different I did worlds. see that. I thought that was delightful to have yeah, that on you your can website head in there you can yes. explore kate kenzie's castle you can go into the different shadow slayers worlds you can explore lenora's castle we'll have the new series coming on board too you can explore the town of hideaway bay um and one of the fun things so um if you're wondering what do you explore there's there's pictures there's character information there's family trees um, you can do all kinds of uh, fun things about learning more about the characters, but we also have a really extensive set of games and puzzles on there. So if you're a game and puzzle enthusiast, head in, every series has their own like book specific games. So there's like a crossword puzzle, the secret of Dunhaven Castle crossword puzzle. There are word searches. There are jigsaw puzzles on there. There are um, cryptograms. So it's a great, even if you're like not a reader or not into the books at all, it's still a really fun free site that you can hop into. You can immerse yourself. I know um, a couple of people have said, you know, I love being on there because I'm clicking around. I feel like I'm in Kate's castle. And then I go to her sitting room and I play games in there. And I feel like I'm like hanging out with the characters. So it's a really fun way to immerse yourself in the world. But even if you're not a, a fan of the books or you're not a reader, it's still really fun if you love games and puzzles. There are free games and puzzles in there. So you can hop in and explore all the different worlds we have and you can play all the games that you want on there. That's awesome. That's great. Um, it, it, talking about all that, it, it actually just gave me one last question. Sure. Looking back, could you have anticipated all of this from that very first book that you wrote for your mom? I mean, like, seriously, like, this is way beyond just having some books for sale with the interactive website and all these different series. I mean, this 
is becoming like an empire, like the Nelly Steel Empire. Um, could could in your wildest dreams, could you have imagined like that all this was going to spring from that first book? No, I never thought when I had published, I think it was like November 2019 or something I had published. I did not think that this so was like two and a half years. All this two is and a half to- years, <laughs> two and a half years. And, and oh like God. we always say we're fans of uh, the movie Christmas Vacation. And so we're, we're always say we're the Griswolds. We're going to do it right. And we're going to do it big. Um, so, you know, I know, uh, I, I tend to like blow things up, which is where we get all the interactive site and all the stuff that I never experience as a reader that I want. Um, so I try to put that out there for people, but no, I did not expect when I hit published two and a half years ago that I was going to have six series and like a seventh and eighth spinning in the background here in my mind and an interactive site and, you know, lots of books. I, never anticipated this i hoped that i kept writing i hope the people like the books did not imagine this that's crazy i mean it's a good thing that you have summers off unless you teach summer classes but i do okay I teach summer yeah. and winter <laughs> okay but i um i i love doing distance learning teaching as well because of that you know and mm-hmm. if, if there were no papers to grade then i would check my email in the morning and then it was like the rest of the day is free at least you know until the evening you know i, I, I can write I can do anything I want, you know. Right. So I, 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 I love that sense of freedom. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, but uh, no, it, it has been a real joy to get to know you today and talk with you. And and thank you again for for coming on the show. I, uh, I so admire and appreciate your enthusiasm and and your creativity. And um, this has been a real joy for me. Well, thank you for having me. It's been really fun to come on and talk more about my writing process and about my books. I always love talking to people about the characters that they like and and the stories that they love. And even if they're not mine, feel free to come on, message me. I love talking to readers. Wonderful. That's great. So you've been watching and listening to Between the Lines. You can listen to us on unsaneradio.com. You can uh, download full episodes, listen to your device. You can watch us on our YouTube page, which is that's where you're at right now, uh, Between the Lines podcast. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you know someone who would like us, tell them about us. And if you're a writer who would like to join me for a chat, email me at betweenthelines54 at yahoo.com, betweenthelines54 at yahoo.com. And here's my cheesy outro, Nelly. See you next time between the lines. Nah. <laughs>